invited me to moderate the panel, and particularly to Brooke. Uh, I got to admit, when I said okay to moderate the panel, my organization, I work, I work for uh, Free Press, uh, another media small public interest group here in DC, and we don't work on copyright issues. Uh, 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 we've worked uh, more and more. We get into the debate because of so broad people and all that, but we is not a main focus of our organization. But as a journalist, you know, I'm a, I'm a, 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 a former journalist and someone who still writes a lot. You know, uh, the issue of fair use always comes up uh, in a very negative way in journalism as the reason as a, as a reason why journalism is in decline that their content is being stolen and. Um, it, you know, it obscures the facts of the other, you know, the real reasons I believe that uh, that journalism is not declined. The news model for news organizations are broken, and and it's been exposed. Uh, newspapers no longer have a monopoly over local ad markets as they once had, and uh, all the consolidation of newspapers has has uh, has uh, find newspapers now unable to pay back the debts they collected, uh, uh, amounted. And, and, and continue to get bigger, uh, and and they're shrinking. Their revenue continue to shrink. You just can't pay back the debt. And in home ownership, you see what happens. When homeowners get vilified from being able to pay back a debt, but the, the newspapers want to blame uh, uh, news aggregators and, and the internet, which is false. But is there real concerns about um, are we being sensitive enough about uh, copyright folks who actually have created original content? Um, but I would say that another reason I was concerned because I really haven't thought much about fair use except when you see these articles and you hear uh, Lynn Downey call you know, Huffington Post is always like it's most of these arrows. Uh, primarily parasites living off the jails and produced by others. Or uh, Bill Keller, who is particularly, especially mean to the Huffington Post, saying buying an aggregator and calling it content, a content play is like a company announcing plans to improve its cash position by hiring counterfeit. So, um, as a person who has been in journalism and, and have really thought about fair use, I feel um, I feel good about being here today because I was reading the American University's reports on on fair use, and I'm going to start off with Angie in a second. But uh, most journalists have little idea what fair use is. It's like anything else. Little, journalists have little idea about the impact of media policy on newsrooms, and they have little idea that they're actually using fair use to. And, uh, to report and actually to uh, make sure that the, the public remains informed. And uh, so it wasn't, wasn't surprising that they have little knowledge of fair use even though the uh, fair use gets vilified. Uh, from a report that came out uh, earlier this year from, uh, uh, from uh, the Center for Social Media called Copyright Free Speech and the Public Right to Know How Journalists Think About Fair Use. There's a quote that, uh, uh, that just I, I want to share. It says, journalists show a strong intuitive sense of the logic of fair use while rarely demonstrating confident or even explicit knowledge of the policy. I would love it, this is a quote from a reporter, I would love it if you could define fair use for me because I'm not entirely sure what it means. Then you have another journalist who said that, uh, that one reporter referred to, to fair use as common sense. You have to have common sense about this. You should just know in general you shouldn't park too close to a hydrant. Now that is uh, not a, a great grasp in, in, for journalists what fair use is. And the fact that they don't have a good grasp of fair use is actually um, uh, hurting their ability to actually report. So with that, uh, um, I want to uh, introduce, uh, introduce panelists real quick. Josh uh, Bort Bort right? yep. he's the editor of The Slatest, and Josh is a former energy reporter for Politico. And prior to Politico, he was an, uh, um, he's former editor uh, of Energy Report for Politico, and before joining Politico, he covered energy and transportation policy, politics, and e e publishing, Green Wire, and E&E and e and e Daily. Ryan Grimm is the Washington Post Bureau Chief for Huffington Post. He's a award winning journalist and former staff reporter for Politico as well, and Washington City Paper and author of uh, This Is Your Country on Drugs. And Andy Chong, 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 Chong. we're going to start with Assistant Professor of School of Communication at American University. Uh, she studies the representation of race and ethnic, ethnic identity uh, in news media and has developed a new class called Race, Ethnic, and Community Reporting. Uh, she joined uh, uh, AU in 2007 after a 13 year career of award winning journal journalist at the Oregonian, the Arthur Current, and the Los Angeles Times. So, Angie, my first question to get this conversation going is what are the common mistakes journalists uh, make about things? What's the common misperception about it? 
Thanks, Joe. That was a great introduction to the um, American University School of Communication Center for Social Media Report, which if you go out on the table, there's um, a bunch of postcards. You can Google it on the website. I really encourage you to take a look at this report. It was compiled with 80 um, interviews with um, journalism industry leaders, online media leaders, working journalists, and what we found, it's not so much that people aren't making mistakes, it's that people aren't thinking about it. And having been a working journalist for 13 years, I, I understand that. I don't think I ever uttered the word fair use in my career. We talked about libel, we talked about obscenity, we talked about um, um, many other issues, but, um, but never fair use. And I think one of the reasons is because it's misunderstood it's very hard to define because, in general, um, the courts and other industries have not have not fully defined fair use or developed best practices. And that's one thing the Center for Social Media is trying to do with the collaboration of those interest groups, whether it be documentary filmmakers, poets, academic researchers, and now journalists. And it's very, very important that journalists have a voice in developing these principles and best practices. I think in most newsrooms, the idea is you put your blinders on, you get what you need to get, and it's sort of better to um, ask forgiveness than permission. Because if you ask permission, you might get lawyered, and no reporter wants to get lawyered, because it means that you're probably going to get restricted. And it's the idea. And there's a sort of resentment of the other set of barriers that you mentioned with the fear of um, co-opting your journalistic material or, or the discomfort with aggregation. Um, I think right now is a great time to start developing these codes of best practices because we're looking at two significant trends. The um, courts and corporations that own material are getting much more aggressive about enforcing copyright. And this will, if it hasn't already affected journalists. I'm sure many of you who do online media have had the experience of getting incidental music in a video and then having it wiped off the internet because the incidental music violated somebody's copyright. Or the ability to use a movie clip. Um, shooting a picture and having somebody have a t-shirt in the picture that has a copyrighted logo. These are all things that every journalist would encounter and, and could potentially be, um, be considered questionable under copyright. So the idea is to um, promote better knowledge and understanding of fair use to give journalists more tools to be able to use more material freely, to not feel like they would have to censor themselves or be unsure or put themselves at risk. Um, the other trend um, it, that's happening is the, um, with the uh, more aggressive enforcement in court and the newer forms of media, that there's a lot of ambiguity about social media, about tweeting, about um, use uh, retweeting and reusing material. Like I said, the aggregation, the kind of um, flap over Romanesco, even though that wasn't portrayed as a fair use issue, is a fair use issue. Um, so I'm sure we'll get into a lot um, a lot of interesting discussion, but that's that's sort of the overview. Great, and uh, we'll start with Josh and, and Ryan as well next. It's like, uh, Josh, so I was uh, reading a quote from you in, in, uh, in Pointer, where you had an article back in December saying that uh, the biggest challenge in giving, is giving readers enough information to understand the story without giving it all away. And I guess one of the common uh, criticisms of news I is, is that uh, uh, you're, uh, you're providing too much information and making a link hard to find, so you can get to, to, to the post can get back to the original source. Uh, and it seems like obviously there's no uh, um, fast and hard rule. So I mean, how do you go about trying to determine what is uh, fair use and uh, what are the conversations you actually have within the slate is about this, and as well as you are. Well, I mean, it's certainly the most difficult part of, of kind of when you step back and think about how you're going to aggregate something. It's ultimately, if you do a good job, right, you, you summarize it all. You, you, if you do the absolute perfect summary, summary of something, you give them all the information, they're not going to click through. Which on the one hand, especially when you're working with younger reporters and, and interns that are really ambitious and want to do their best job, they're, they're trying to do that. And it's difficult to tell them, no, you can't, you can't give it all away. You have, to, you have to do an incomplete job. But at the same time, our value as an aggregator is, is giving those summaries and giving our readers the point where right we can say something in 200 words that took someone else to say a thousand. Well, that's a transformative value right there. And we're giving them, giving them that. The, as far as making those decisions as, as we move, the, the easy part for us is I'm 
I'm a former reporter. Uh, uh, the people that, that I work with are either reporters, one of the reporters, or old reporters. So, so everyone is, you're borrowing from any inferior colleagues. So there's this idea that if someone were aggregating me the way that I am aggregating them, would they be comfortable with it? And that's, I think, the, you know, the ground rule where, where we base everything that we go off of. It is, it is ultimately that intuitive feel and you'll know when you see it, which is a little dangerous, admittedly. And, and certainly, I didn't actually stop to think about a lot of the various issues until they contacted me for this panel and I quickly went to Wikipedia <laughs> and found everything I could. But, but, but ultimately, it, it, it is this issue of there, there's no, it's a case-by-case it's case issue on, on every single news story. And, and ultimately, if we stay towards the aggregating merely facts and ideas which obviously can't be copyrighted versus aggregating more of a conceptual scoop in a way where where they can no longer, it, it removes, sorry, I ran for a little bit. If, uh, if, if you aggregate a conceptual scoop more, someone's like, connecting dots and, and reporting on a trend, that's a little bit more dangerous because they've done this legwork and it's this intense, this intense effort which there's a danger of stealing and, and not giving, even if you credit them, but denying them the links. The drag reading really facts, Obama said something, this bill passed, I think it's a little bit different, a little bit more leeway in citing them, sure, because you can always want to give your reader a link to find more, but there's less of a danger of, of stealing something. So let me ask you, Josh, and I'll please hold on in a second. Um, we, uh, how big is your staff? It varies on a day-to-day -day basis from, um, for those of you that aren't familiar, this latest is kind of the aggregation vertical within Slate Magazine. Right. It started as today's papers, and then moved into something that looked a whole lot like what the Daily Beast has, with, you know, the 12 quick hits. And then the latest incarnation is what it is now. It's a, a news blog where we cover breaking news and we'll try to aggregate the stories that are, are kind of driving today's conversation. Um, our staff, when we first did the overhaul, it was just me. So that was a, a frantic panic every day. Then um, killed the modded and they realized maybe that was, we needed some more people <laughs> for big events like that. Um, and so now on any given day, um, we might have anywhere from two or three people ready for us to up to a And do you have a policy on venues and guidelines? Um, we do not. Uh, so Ryan, uh, just spend a little time with the folks because you get, a, you get a lot of arrows. And um, how big is just that? And is there any guidelines of that you how, do you get trained or is it discussed as part of orientation, as part of being a member of the post staff? Well, in Washington, there's Washington there's about 40 to 40 to 45 editorial staffers, uh, and about eight or nine are on what we call the vertical team. Which is which runs the politics page, and and they get intense training on on what on, on what's fair to do. And I think I think one thing that gets missed when we talk about how to how to aggregate a specific story or how fair use applies to a specific story is kind of a, the the broader benefit that that a website can bring um, through through aggregation, kind of the aggregate value of aggregation, I guess. The uh, you know, the, the perspective of the Huffington Post, as I said, the perspective of the Daily Caller, the perspective of Drudge, the perspective of the New York Times, they're, they're, all, they're all different. And so what, what the Huffington Post is doing overall is saying, here are the 20 or 25 stories that we think you're going to think are, are the ones that you want to read right now. And so, and so you, you miss that by focusing on each, each individual story. If you go to the New York Times website, you're going to get a completely different experience than if you go to the, to the Huffington Post website. Um, so, you know, I think Keller has missed that, and a lot of others have missed that when they're when they're uh, knocking just pure aggregation. Because if there wasn't any any value to to pulling out, uh, say, the 13th paragraph of this story that is buried on you know a deep page within say, the New York Times website, then people would stop coming to us because. Right. You know what the New York Times is doing is, is, is very good. They're, they're, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent product, but uh, by aggregating from a different perspective, then we're giving readers something genuinely different and yeah. valuable. I should let off that question first. I mean, that's going to be my next question. What is the uh, journalistic and informational benefits of news aggregation? Because it, it is an important uh, societal benefit. 
And so um, that is that you are able to provide a diversity perspective to new stories and uh, add to the public discourse of new stories that are out there and, and take facts and, and uh, reinterpret them. Uh, right, I mean, until, until the internet came along, it was kind of up to television and radio to take, you know, because, you know, the bulk of reporting has always been done um, by, by print reporters. And so, up until the internet, uh, you know, you'd have, you might have conservative radio that would take a New York Times story and give it a different spin and talk about it for a couple hours. Or, or you might have uh, different television shows treated in a different way. When the, when the internet came around, it became a new place where you could go to, to get a different to get a different take on kind of the same facts, sort of. Right. So, um, but you know, uh, so to play devil's advocate, um, I'm sure Huffington Post and, and how much of the content you actually put, you use, and where you place the link, and how the folks are able to easily assess the original material or is it being credited. I mean, most websites, the goal is not to have them leave the website. Right, is to is to keep them on the website, and not uh, you want them to visit other parts of the website, not direct them to other traffic. So, is, is a conflict of interest would you say between the goals of making sure people stay on your page as long as possible and get the other content, with making sure they can get back to the original source? How do you deal with those two? Well, I think what what has made us successful is is our kind of uh, will, willingness to send people off the page. We we try to think of the the site as as a meritocracy, and that our own original reporting doesn't have any kind of advantage over other reporting. If if somebody else, if the Washington Post has done a better job on a story than one of our reporters has done, then our top piece will link directly to the Washington Post, and we're okay with that. And I think it's good to be okay with that because readers know that when they come there, they're going to get the best of what's out on the internet rather than the best of what, what we've created. And so a lot of the kind of the mainstream media papers have, have approached uh, their website in a, in a vacuum, of kind of uh, pretending as if readers don't have the ability to go to other websites and find out what else is going on. Uh, so let, let's say you go to the Washington Post and you're, and you're looking for a particular story, but the Post doesn't have any original reporting on it yet. They might not have something up on it yet. So a reader is not going to read a worse story they're going to leave and go somewhere else. I know uh, Politico, is, I think it's changing its attitude a little bit towards aggregation, but uh, when I was there, if the New York Times had reported something, you know, we wouldn't put it up on our site until we had confirmed it, which I think is a misunderstanding of the way that readers consume news. I, I, I don't know a reader who's saying, well, the New York Times is reporting it, but I'm waiting for Politico to have unnamed congressional aides saying that it's true. Then, then I'll believe it. That you know, readers want the news fast, and they want it to be credible. So, so um, Angie, um, so we have a, a two organizations here that news aggregation is their business. So, uh, when do you think uh, unfair, you know, fair news is, is, is being uh, used the name unfair? Is there, is, does the uh, center have uh, any examples or or discuss this at all? Yes, it's definitely in the report, and I think the belief of the center and what came out of the meetings that we've had, and we're currently working with the Society of Professional Journalists to develop a code of principles, much like the SPJ Code of Ethics. And one of the things that needs to be worked out is that um, collectively, journalists from the traditional legacy media world and the aggregation world and the new media world need to get together and find how they can, rather than being at odds or feeling like one person is taking away from the other, they need to find a way to move the industry forward and accept that aggregation is going to be part of the new media landscape. It's not going to go away. And so how can we collectively, as journalists, with all the same aims, our aims are to inform the public, are to um, practice um, uh, journalism's democratic role, can we develop a model in which people are people are comfortable with the use of of you know is it like your example of um, summarizing things to the point where you're not taking away from the conceptual um, nature of somebody's scoop or somebody's work? Um, but I think just 
either being at odds again uh, with each other or putting your head in the sand and pretending like this isn't changing is not the way to do it. So there's no, we're not at a recommendation stage yet because we really want the industry, people in the industry to talk to each other and decide how, how best to, to address this. Judge, I'll ask you too, uh, what is phase unfair? And then uh, what is, uh, when Ryan answered the uh, uh, discussion, what is, what are, what is the criticism of that game? What, what is, what, what are they getting wrong in their criticism? Um, well, first of all, my first take on, on the very I mean, I said to separate the kind of journalism and the business, which is, in theory, there's always that firewall that with smaller staffs than ever is. I'm, I'm the editor of the space, but I, I'm looking at traffic all the time, and I'm, I want to the pages. But, but also, from a journalist side, as, as long as I'm, I'm, we cite everything, we never, we never take a fact or a quote without explaining where it came from and, and providing the link. And ultimately, from, from a straight sharing information, I, I think we're completely Everything's fine. I can understand kind of the, the professional critique there of the original source feeling so they've been denied their their, <coughs> or their unique visitor. But but ultimately, I mean, if you look at I'm trying to think about so Politico broke their Herman Cain story. Great, great suit for them. Dominated the, the conversation here for, for weeks. Ultimately, the initial reporting on that for most everyone was some form of reservation. You could do it like the latest or the Atlantic Wire or the Daily Beast does it, and it, it's very clear it's aggregation. Or you could do it how ABC News or CBS News did it right away, where they're just citing Politico in their lead or in their second draft. But ultimately, it's still aggregation. They get to get to the point where they are providing their own confirmation or their own original reporting. Yet somehow that is is viewed differently, which I think is a little unfair on the professional critique side. But ultimately, with that story, the its footprint, the amount of people that were aware of the Herman Cain story almost instantaneously was so much larger than the people that had visited the Politico site to read the story. And while that was, in theory, every person denied Politico one click, everyone who knew that Herman Cain story, if they heard it from the Nightly News, or if they heard it from the Slates, if they heard it from Huffington Post, they technically denied Politico that click. But I don't think, I think it's, it's a, it's a wrong headed way to look at it if you do it just on page text. As a result, Politico, they were cited so often that it, that it helps their brand. That, that while they're still you know, a giant organization and, and lots of people know who they are, after the Herman Cain story, a whole lot more people knew who they were. And maybe they didn't click through to the Herman Cain story, but maybe the next day they went to the, the homepage to check out what this Politico site is. And then if they're a political fan, I'm sure that they came back 10 times that day, or they signed up for in the newsletter. So, while you might deny an outlet their, their specific page click, and as a result, a lot of the numbers we can see, we don't track specific click-throughs on everything we have, but we have an idea on how many people click through, and it's not, it's not a large percent. But if you, if you look at the broader picture of, of as long as you're citing and giving credit where credit's due, I think that there's this idea that in, in the long term that we're not doing as much damage as I think a lot of the professional critiques have implied that, that aggregation does. Right. I just, can I just add, yeah, I sure. wanted to add. I want to say something one second, Andy. Uh, please, uh, if anyone has questions, uh, please uh, raise your hand and we'll get the questions at the end. You make comment, right? I just want to add really quickly that what Josh has reminded me that what we heard from working journalists was that there was this real double-edged sword. On the one hand, uh, there's discomfort with having your work aggregated. Definitely on the business side, there's discomfort with that. But on the journalist side, in a way, it was like, I love it when my piece is at the top of the post. You know, everybody looks at it, as long as I get credit. And I think credit and citation is the important part. And I think that's going to be really key to, to making this work. OK, so we have a question uh, right now. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say, look at name, the name and organization. The mic, the mic. The mic right here. Hi, my name is Paige Gold. I was part of the Future of Media Task Force at the FCC. Okay. Did the Sure. I'm sitting looking at the bigger picture. Uh, the argument is that you want these clicks because ultimately you'll figure out a way to monetize it all. And the New York Times is arguing that we're losing money because people are taking our material. But actually, there's no way to prove, is there, that that's what's causing them to lose money. And um, ideally, I would suppose if the New York Times could, make, could generate income based on and Politico and Huffington Post, 
they might not object. Uh, I just wanted to think of, uh, talk about the business aspect because it seems at this point almost like everybody's you know, fighting over these speculative profits and nobody really knows how they're actually going to make money off of it. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I think they're probably objecting more on principle than a practical loss. Uh, you know, we, we do a ton of original reporting now, and it often gets linked on other sites, and we're always happy when that happens. And it's never occurred to me that we would uh, be suffering when other sites were taking our stuff and linking back to us. Is there an instance where uh, you guys broke, uh, you feel like you guys broke uh, original uh, stories and you feel like you didn't get credit from like mainstream news organizations who uh, aggregate your content without properly citing? Oh, it happens all the time, yeah. I mean, well, let's see. Um, maybe a month or so ago, we, we posted a story that uh, uh, Warren Buffett's private jet company had uh, spent millions of dollars lobbying to get a tax break in Congress, and that succeeded. And uh, that story was basically rewritten by the Wall Street Journal a month later. I'm not sure they did all the original reporting, but there's no way that they would see our story. And uh, they didn't. They credit us. Uh, I would call that aggregation, a bad kind of aggregation. So you seem to go both ways. Right, but you know, it's but people have been doing that in journalism for hundreds of years. So it's kind of almost nice to see it being done to us. It means we you know, rise as part of the, the rest of the journalism. You know, right. You want to take up the question? Well, I, I was going to get at that. The, I mean, especially, and I think Brad touched on it earlier too, about how. The traditional outlets are, they still treat it as though they're, they're siloed off, that, that you're on the New York Times website, but it's as though you have the paper in your hand and you can't pick up enough paper. I mean, ultimately, obviously, it, it, it wouldn't necessarily hurt the New York Times or some giant big unit like that, but for some of these smaller sites that are, that are coming up, the, the biggest insult you can do is to exclude them from the conversation, to, to not, to you know, pull a code book that's still a current story and everyone would ignore it because they just, they just treated it completely separate. Like, that's what would happen because it was a giant story in political at this point, is a giant organization. But when they were first getting their start, if they were just to deny entry into the, the larger online news and culture conversations that's going on by, by excluding certain sources, it, it, I think there, there's a harm there that, that I think a lot of these outlets, they don't, they don't consider. Obviously, the New York Times isn't worried that if the slightest doesn't, you, I agree with their stories that people won't know the New York Times exists. I, I'm not saying that, but I do think that it speaks to the larger, that there's, no one's figured out how to monetize this series of page views yet, but I think that there's a, a large value for these outlets having their their information aggregated as long as they're studying the problem so people know where the outlets exist and what they're covering and, and that they are doing good work. Um, I just want to add really quickly, the, um, the belief of the interviewees in the Center for Social Media um, process was that it's short-sighted to look at aggregation as the reason why journalism is in financial trouble. There's much, much deeper issues about um, business model, audience, and that that we need to look beyond just blaming, you know, blaming aggregation sites or blaming the the repurposing material as the reason why the industry is in trouble. Yeah, I would just say that uh, you know, actually, a couple of years ago, uh, newspaper holdings made a 21 uh, percent profit margin, but yet the collection was on the verge of collapse it's because of the debt they took on from acquiring Night River. And, uh, and this is a case of you know, Gannett furloughs of its employees during the first quarter when it was making a 19% profit margin. And if you make a 21% profit margin, uh, you should be a successful business model. But, uh, but when you're making 40% uh, profit margin and uh, your local ad rates get uh, uh, in competition now with uh, online advertising and, and you go from a 40% profit margin to 20, Wall Street doesn't like you. So, uh, that's the real, in my opinion, that is one of the major reasons why this people I help. So, uh, Michael Nelson for Penn University. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about where we're going, where the next technology is going to take us, and I was interested that in, you mostly talked about text in your most of the discussions during that articles. There's a lot of people who are going to make a lot more money selling data and tools to play with data. There's also the new thing of infographics, which are a nice, powerful way to convey information. I'd like to know how you think fair use will work in this new world. What happens when you take somebody else's infographic and you simplify it and make your own very powerful infographic using all of their numbers? 
what do you do if you sweep up somebody else's database and make a new product out of it? Maybe you can buy your own software and sort through it, but the, the raw data is there. In Europe, 10 years ago, they passed a law to create a new type of intellectual property to protect databases. It hasn't happened here, but certainly the database providers would love to see that, would love to have some protection. So how do you think fair use for images, infographics, and particular databases, and the tools that you use to play with databases will play out in the next few years? Well, if, uh, I would think that you, that you could uh, construct the same uh, regime around images that you could around photos, but that's if people want their um, images to be kept silent on their site. We, whenever we make an image, we encourage it to be embedded in other sites. Uh, so that it can then run on Facebook and, and you know, so, so it can be spread around socially. So, um, but, I mean, that, that's that's how I think images would be, would be treated. I think academic research is also going to um, overlap with that because there's a lot of questions now about people wanting to mine huge data sets that come out of Twitter usage, for example, or or um, links, uh, patterns of linking, um, liking on Facebook. These are great avenues for studying um, sociological behavior, media phenomenon, and the question of how much of that should be accessible to researchers and journalists is, and this is all new territory. As Joe said, the reasons why we have controversies are very often because things are new. And I think the position of the Center for Social Media is it's better to get out ahead with the practitioners and start to develop these, uh, these codes rather than let the court system um, decide for us. Have you seen cases where journalists have been taken to ask for using someone's database without permission? Not, data not with data. Not with data that I know of, but, but or, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Or infographics, somebody else's graph that you just lift it out and modify that it. That I'm not bit. aware of. I know, I know data is still a pretty good. I'm not I, sure. I think right now what's stopping the problems from having the infographics is you can aggregate text quickly, but infographic, you almost, it's almost not worth your time to, because to, you can, an infographic's gonna have their source right at the bottom. If you wanted, you could go get that number and you can make your own chart, but ultimately that took a lot of work. I, I think it's, just, I think as a, at the speed that the web, and specifically aggregation moves, I think, at least with the tools we have right now, infographics are, would be very difficult, but that also would change as soon as, yeah, as soon as the next graduating class comes through. Uh, Sherman C. Public College. I, I, I was wondering about something that, that you pointed out when you were comparing uh, aggregation by, by sites like Daily Beast and Slightest and HuffPo to aggregation by more traditional media, like when APC would take that political, political story. Um, and it seemed, you, you kept mentioning though that, that with a traditional media, they would make, they would make sure to do you know, their own confirmation of things. Uh, so it seems like there's at least a couple of different a couple of different factors at, at work. One of them is, is how much credit goes to the original sources. That's something that you're uh, interested in, in making sure that you provide. Uh, and the other is providing confirmation of the fact, which is something that it seems like the traditional media is more concerned with. They, they see the value in breaking the story, so they see their value in uh, confirming the story and they can sort of downplay the, the uh, accreditation. I was wondering if you could talk about that. I feel like it's, as Josh said, they don't, they don't always uh, confirm it themselves. If it's a powerful and fast-moving story, then uh, the, their desire to get it up on their site will, will overwhelm that desire to have it independent, independently sourced. Um, so I think part, part of the tension comes in what, for lack of a better term, I'd call the ego of the, of the, of the outlet. If, uh, if we see a story that's on the Washington Post, we, we credit the Washington Post with a great deal of, of credibility and integrity, and so we don't feel like we need it. We need to go out and find an independent source to confirm that. Uh, that, and, that, and, that is, and that. And that goes to our judgment as an aggregator. If, if readers ultimately don't trust us to be linking to credible content, they're not gonna, they're not gonna come back to us. So if we see a less credible source, then we will go out and confirm it for ourselves before we, before we put it up on our site, whereas for a mainstream outlet, they don't, they don't usually make that judgment. They, they don't care if it's on the New York Times or if it's on NBC or the Washington Post. If they haven't themselves personally confirmed it, then they'll often hold off on it, except within some of their, uh, some of their 
blogs that are deeper into the site who, who kind of have more of a up post attitude towards things than, than say the front page might. I mean, I, I think that gets back to kind of this business journalism that I, I mean, ultimately, if you're speaking solely journalistically and the idea that we're all one giant journalistic ecosystem and we want to provide as much and as best information as possible, you have to wonder if, if it's worth the time of 50 reporters in DC, one from each bureau, chasing down a story that everyone knows to be true, but the political broke it or Huffington Post broke it and you want to confirm it soon because that's it's understandable, that's what the New York Times does, it's tradition, but, but ultimately, if those reporters spent their time chasing the next story, pushing the story forward, and didn't worry about going back and getting the press secretary to confirm every quote, or, or to dig up and, and follow the, the trail of the reporter left so you could piece together their story. Like, I, I don't want to discount the need for independent confirmation, and, and it's always great to double check facts. I certainly don't want to do that. But, but the issue is there's, there are only so many reporters, and there's always more stories than there are reporters. And if, I think it's better served to see people spread far and wide than than narrow and deep on a lot of these issues. Okay, I got a couple more questions. If anyone has questions, please get to the mic. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, Ryan, can you speak to the uh, recent controversies with HuffPost when they were coming with uh, last year when it came to the whole at age situation with the report that they had uh, suspended for lifting too much to go to the story? Um, um, and, uh, can you talk about that, that controversy and any lessons learned? When something like that happens, what happens within a news organization like HuffPost? Are your lessons learned? Or do you recalibrate uh, the policy? Is there retraining the journalists? <laughs> what happens? What happens? Yeah, I think after that, there was, there was a, a re-emphasis. Can you explain what would happen? Yeah. Uh, if I re remember correctly, uh, somebody had aggregated a story without adding a much of any value to it. That's, right. I think that, and, and, had, and, had, and had basically included all of the relevant details from the story, which left little reason to, to click back to the original. So it was, you know, there was just a, a reason to say that that's, that, that's, that that's not what we're doing, um, that, that we're, we're trying to add value specifically to that individual story, but we're, all, we're also trying to uh, you know, create a place that has a kind of a voice. And if we're not going to add any value to that specific story, then just link directly to it, it's fine. So I know Angie, in your report, you talk about um, that journalists are maybe trained early on uh, on fair use. The policy within news organizations are so hard to understand at times that the journalists are afraid to even like, use it or go to the lawyer because the lawyer is so conservative it's going to actually shut them down to be more creative. Um, um, I mean, to Ryan, we can talk, you can add on to that. So Ryan, when, um, you see, there is an extensive training, uh, and this is a question for both of you, Angie and, and Ryan. Let's start with Angie first, then. Um, how, um, so you get your report, you go in the newsroom, and, and everything is changing in this world, digital media, and you get trained when you first come on orientation. Uh, <coughs> is that enough? What should happen? Uh, should it be constant training? Should it be updated every year? I mean, um, how should journal continue to be trained on this issue? The truth is, in my experience, I didn't get a lot of training on fair use. I don't think it was ever, like I said, I don't think it was ever mentioned in the newsroom. That may have changed nowadays, but it wasn't It wasn't standard practice. We got barely trained on things like libel and obscenity, and maybe, I think it's, it's often, copyright is the term that's often used, and copyright is a bad thing, because copyright is you can't use this. <laughs> And I think one of the things that people, journalists, don't really realize is that the realm of things that can be copyrighted is vast, and it makes journalists very uncomfortable when you start to list these things. So technically, under copyright law, um, doing an interview with somebody, that person can claim that the quotes that they give you are copyrighted, even though they consented to the interview. And um, if you use a document, we think, OK, all government documents are public domain, right? If that document was produced by a private contractor for a government organization, that could be copyrighted. And so you just get into it. And I, I think journalists need more knowledge. I think there needs to be much more training. And I do think there should be not just training, but discussions, open discussions, where you bring the lawyer in not to check on 
whether or not you can run something, but to have a conversation about. And the truth is that there isn't, there aren't hard and fast laws, there are um, rules. It's not like, oh, if I use 30 seconds of the film or broadcast, it's okay, but if I use 35 seconds, it's not okay. And there's this sort of, um, you know, uh, misunderstanding that if I just use a little bit, bit of it, I'm safe. So I think in general, what we're trying to promote is not just individual newsrooms, but the whole industry. And you do say in the report it. that when, when newsrooms actually do have a policy that it's discussed, the likelihood of un, uh, unfair, fair use actually minimizes. it. Yes, and I think it's just in the nature of journalists. They don't like, journalists don't like rules. They don't like restrictions. And I think what we're trying to do is say fair use is actually a tool that will help you be able to use more things without putting yourself at risk. And it's, it's empowering you to have access to more material to argue that you're repurposing the material for another use. That's the, that's the idea of fair use. I'm, I'm using Michael Jackson's music in his obituary not because I'm selling the music or I'm giving the user the music. I'm trying to tell a story about how his music reflected his life. And that's, that's the principle of fair use that and so, so, Ryan, you said you did extensive training in the beginning. Is there continued training once you have that first initial training, or uh, is it discussed again, or, or how does it work? With well, it, uh, it's constantly reinforced because we're practicing it every day. And so uh, people who are you know, more versed in it than others will be constantly providing guidance to people who are less well versed. So it, it, it's, it's an ongoing thing. Do you check lawyers and lawyers involved in some of this stuff? And Josh, you say you don't have any policy. Is it, uh, yeah, so I put you on the spot. We have, we have a formal policy. Formal policy, but uh, after hearing the conversation, mm -hmm. what's your thoughts on the issue of policy? And again, journalists do not like rules at times, you know, but what do you, what's your thoughts on it when you're hearing on this issue? Well, I think it's, the policy? it's, it's certainly, uh, with, within aggregation, the ultimate <coughs> are those people who are doing the basic aggregation, the most aggregation of aggregation, the summaries and the quick hits, they're most likely to be your interns or entry level reporters or people with the least amount of experience. And I think that that is what, what leads to a lot of these problems because it is, the fair use issues are much more prevalent now that we're online than we are aggregating. So there's not necessarily that institutional knowledge and they might not have learned it in, if they got a J school degree sure. or in a Microsoft in a rural daily in South Carolina. Like education and copyright really wasn't on our radar. And, and I, I do think that there's, there needs to be a little bit more, more training, a little bit more. There, there's an obligation to those younger reporters that are, that are coming in, those that are severely underpaid, that, that we need to teach them better on this. Um, but speaking to the issue about the rules, I mean, you also don't want to scare them. We had a, just in general, the state staff had a professional course on libel. We talked to the lawyers because it was late. It was all these back and forth questions that our reporters got all into it. But then at the same time, I mean, like, I left terrified. For the next, like, day, I was convinced that I was going to be going to get a libel suit my way. And, and ultimately, I hadn't done anything wrong. And, and ultimately, we didn't change how we were doing it. We were completely within in the rules. But there is just, there is this concept that it is going to handcuff you and slow you down. So I guess it is, it is difficult to tow that line to both keep people informed. But also, if, if people are doing a good job, you want them to know why they're doing a good job, but maybe you don't want them to know too much without without, I guess, just getting people stolen down, I guess, is an issue. Uh, Andy, back to you. Um, as far as uh, the issue of innovation, um, you have a question. Uh, uh, innovation, um, you know, the fact that there are, you know, there's, there's criticism of the mainstream media is that the criticism of news aggregators is uh, unjust in the sense they had an opportunity, have, that the news aggregators actually, and you talked about earlier, Ryan, uh, take this information and present it in a much more digestible way uh, for folks, and um, and because uh, uh, you know it's only a, a, a bigger issue over the past decade or so, because uh, when you have limited news outlets, it's hard to have a diversity of viewpoint um, and to have a uh, greater public discourse. But the internet allows great public discourse, allowing people uh, to be able to weigh on issues, and and, and um, the fact that it's presenting news in a more digestible way, in the sense that the newspapers uh, and news organizations had the ability to do news aggregation themselves. And, and, have, and it was still stuck on a whole model that they didn't innovate like the newer companies are. Why don't you talk about that for a second? You talk about it in the report. Is there anything to add to that as far as 
uh, some of the criticism that is, is always going to be criticized is going to finger pointed back at you that this is something that new, more news organizations are doing now, but it's something that they couldn't have done way before a post of the slaves. Yeah, and it's, you know, the, um, the mainstream media traditional news organizations, especially the large newspapers, are the battleships of the industry. And you know how long it takes to turn a battleship. And the idea was, I think that, um, and this is not a bad thing, that journalists have always taken pride in their work, in their original reporting, their way of framing or couching a story, their writing. And there was this resistance that if we're going to somehow um, summarize it or diminish it or not present it in its absolute purest form on the front page of the newspaper, then we're taking something away from it. And that it's it's actually diminishing the, the, the value of my work, which was really, that's, you know, pre-internet thinking. It's, um, it's we're, we're past that now. And I think, I think both can exist. I think that we need to change our thinking and see aggregation as a way to get more readers, to get more exposure, to encourage people to click on that link and look at the full version of the story rather than to say, okay, I read the paragraph, I'm okay now. Some people might do that, and that's great, but we need to have both. So. Joe Torres, uh, this is Robert Pinsky. Uh, I was very interested and kind of convinced by your partly economic analysis of um, <laughs> well, the, the economic I, person, but I really like thinking about um, the decades of consolidation, yeah. increasingly monolithic news sources in the way of newspaper, newspaper chains, TV networks, and the uh, debt, the investment that was made in that consolidation yeah. now being reversed as things are more pluralistic uh, and less monolithic. Uh, it's an appealing idea. Uh, I wonder if you would talk about the counter arguments, maybe I've been propagandized, but the counter argument is that it's an overall social loss because the expenses, the leading example usually is uh, foreign uh, uh, international news and the expense of having uh, uh, agents in uh, lots of different, in Africa, in Asia, and uh, that expense is being shouldered by these same monoliths. And so their argument is, yeah, but if we don't do this, society as a whole and the world as a whole is going to uh, lose. Well, um, so I answer to that, that uh, um, so consolidation started really happening in newspapers rapidly in the 1960s when Gannett, when this whole publicly traded, notion of a publicly traded company, uh, Gannett was really the first one to popularize it. And the Washington Post followed suit, and New York Times, all these other companies followed suit. And, um, and during the 1990s, I believe uh, uh, there were something like uh, half the newspapers in this country were, were sold. And there was all this transaction, uh, newspapers being flipped, right? And all this consolidation happened. And you remember in 2001, Jay Harris was the editor of the, of the uh, publisher of the San Jose Mercury News. And he quit because he refused the mandate by Knight Ritter to continue to cut profits. Profits were uh, anywhere between, average between 22 and 29 percent. And they wanted more. And he said, there's no way to continue to cut more without hurting journalists. So journalists were being laid off way before this economic crisis in, in the newsroom started to happen because they had to uh, meet expectations of Wall Street. Uh, they were cutting state bureaus. They were cutting, uh, I mean, who covers government agencies? And all the important work, I mean, there's more people it's, there's a lot of reporters coming in Congress, and particularly from, in this city with um, newsletters and stuff like that. But then no one's covering the agencies. So all these uh, newspapers who can cover the state bureaus and, and have uh, uh, reporters in Iraq and all that, they're cutting them way before this crisis because they had to please the economic uh, the investors. Look at what happened to Chidium. I'm buying time, uh, my, uh, Times Mirror. It's a disaster. So um, newspapers in 2001 were more profitable it was one of the most profitable years in his history. And yet, a decade later, he's on the verge of collapse. Can I add yeah, please, that. two things to that. Uh, there's, you know, there's some structural things that aren't mentioned much that, that changed as well. You know, newspapers had uh, three major sources of revenue. They had classifieds, they had car dealerships, and they had Macy's, or the, or the, lo or the local mall. Uh, Macy's 
has been in dramatic decline, as have these mixed department stores. The car dealerships have shrunk by something like half. And the, but the classifieds is where they really got killed because that was free content that people were creating yes. for these newspapers. Yes. And many people picked up the newspaper for that free content, not for what was on the front page, but because they wanted to look at what was in the classifieds. And not only was it free content, people were paying yeah. to produce this content. And so uh, once that disappeared as a result of uh, Craigslist, I watched it happen while I was at the city paper, you know, that, that was just a dramatic loss. And to, to your point, though, I'd say that uh, back in the 80s, 90s, uh, people had to wait for, say, the Baltimore Sun's Foreign Bureau to decide to do some reporting from whatever particular bureau they wanted to write about. And great for them that they had all those bureaus, but today, <laughs> Readers have exponentially more access to foreign reporting than they did even in the heyday of the mainstream media. Across the world. In what sense? Well, first of all, I mean, Huffington Post has a, a UK, a Canada, a France, and a, and a Spanish site. But if if you want to know what's going on in the Middle East, you can go to Al Jazeera.net. That's true. Which you could not do 20 years ago. So if you want to know what's going on in Russia, you can get uh, English language Russian papers. China the same. Africa, South America. Well, what is being hurt is um, still most local communities want to focus on local news. And while we have maybe national perspectives on stuff, we don't have, uh, I was just in Arkansas, and people complain about the local Arkansas paper and what's not being covered in the state capitol. Um, you know, and the classified thing is that it costs a lot of money at one time to place your car for sale or to sell your food time. And advertisers, <laughs> advertisers have more, uh, no, People have more choice now to more inexpensively try to sell their product. It's a good thing. You know, there's no reason why these, you know, uh, newspapers couldn't innovate and create Groupon and stuff like that. You know, so it's. I'll, I'll say that this because you can see I, I have issues with when with all this criticism of the internet from the newspaper folks. Um, you know, a, a family-owned paper owners used to say, you know, if I made a 12% profit margin, I was having a good year. And, uh, and, and but that changed with, when it comes to consolidation. Wall Street, uh, corporate Wall Street control of this uh, question. Sure. Yeah. One of the most interesting talks I've heard this month was by Dr. Henning, who's the CEO of Mendeley. This is a new platform, a little bit like Evernote, that will take all the things you read online, and all the articles you read, and all the websites, and synthesize them. Just automatically give you the 20% or the 10% that you want to look at. <coughs> We have technologies like this that are going to provide us better access to information. I like the good pieces. It's Mendeley, M E N D E L E Y. Mm -hmm. Same time, we have these robo writers who are developing some sports articles and how we read them by computer. I'm kind of curious of how you can see fair use evolving. I mean, are, are computers going to demand uh, copyright? They're generating thousands of articles a day from the tweet screen. How, how is fair use going to exist in this new world where we're going to have 50 or 100 times more content being automatically generated, either from raw data like sports scores or from you know, the whole blogosphere? You know, it's a good question. I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, say, please answer that question to all the panelists. And my last question is going to be exactly what, uh, what you touched on. What do you see the future of aggregation, the future of fair use? Uh, where is it heading? And so you riff off this question. and. Want to take it somewhere else, please? And this will be the closing statements. Um, I'm not quite sure on the satellite overload large question. <laughs> uh, I, I guess ultimately, if it's robot generated, it is they're plugging in facts. So I don't think there's really a copyright issue there because the facts are fair game. Um, as far as the uh, synthesizing the whole internet, you know, plugging in. I don't, I don't know enough to really speak on that, but it seems as though it's really just the next step in aggregation. Um, as far as where our aggregation is going and, and kind of where aggregation of the whole is going, you know, I, I think it's it's going to, I don't really know, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, like ultimately, the, the goal is really just to, to, to get better and, and to link to more people and have them link back to you. And, and I think we're, the initial stages of aggregation felt a little bit like, as, as Ryan was saying earlier, this concept that, that they are not afraid to send people away because they know they'll come back. And I think that that is a new, newer attitude that is becoming more prevalent online, 
when people realize that they don't stay on your site all day. They, they come, they go, they come back, they go. And if everyone is doing the same thing where we're linking to HuffPo and HuffPo is linking back to us, ultimately that's going to drive up our total page views and people will be less afraid of losing your reader because they know that they will come back. There's this concept that we're, no, we're not a standalone entity. And I think that the sooner all aggregators and publications realize that, and I, I think you don't even need to separate them. From, from the whole publication. As soon as people realize that you can send people away and they will come back, I think that we'll, we'll get over a lot of these hurdles and a lot of these hard feelings about feeling as though original reporting is being stolen or, 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 or the aggregators or, or parasites. Because also people just feed into the conversation. People online, Twitter, they're clicking on more things, they're moving more. So ultimately, it's not a, a zero-sum game. People aren't really going to read 10 stories if we're aggregating and we link and they look back, people weren't even 30 stories that day. And so ultimately I don't think that, I, I think that there's definitely, I have an optimistic view of not just how aggregation will serve readers, but also how organizations will get over a lot of the hard feelings and the, just the uncomfortable and unease that some of the traditional outlets have with, with how some of your outlets can handle things. I think the key as we move forward, there's no way to know what's coming and there's no way to prepare for what journals will look like 10 years from now and decide ahead of time how we're going to, we, we can't even figure out these issues for what exists now. And so I think the key is to develop principles, not rules. And I know any of you who work in journalism have worked with the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. It's a very workable set of principles that apply, that have that have stayed true to all the changes that we've had. And I think we're trying to develop something very similar. And so I'm going to put in a plug. Um, the American University Center for Social Media is having um, small group sessions on May 10th and 11th. Uh, lunch will be provided uh, for working journalists to help this uh, SPJ develop this code for fair use. And we would love to have any working journalists come and join the discussion. So just let me know or contact the um, email address on the website if you'd like to take part in those discussions. And I think it has to come from the industry. The industry has to decide what its principles are, and the principles have to be broad enough so that they do absorb what's coming, um, even things that we can't see. And I think the, the core of the principle needs to be that more information is better, access to more information, the ability to use more information without dishonoring people's work their creativity, their, their personal um, staff, their reporting, their, their shoe leather. Um, but that we need to create an open environment for more information to share. I, I, think, I think the challenge will be to, for aggregators and all websites will be to figure out, is to continue to figure out uh, news consumer behavior. Uh, as, as readers get more and more news uh, over email, through their social networks, uh, through Twitter, uh, through uh, searching for it online, you're going to have, I think, fewer people going to individual websites. I think you're already seeing kind of the eclipse of, of the, the kind of blog form that, that came about in 2003 or 04. Fewer people are going directly to these, these blogs and just trying to get them aggregated either in their inbox or on their Twitter or on their on Facebook. And so the challenge will be uh, to figure out how to make sure that you're, you're in that stream, one. And two, to figure out how you can hopefully continue to be one of the sites that, that people still do actually go directly to the visit. Because I think despite um, the ability to synthesize your news based on exactly what your preference is, or to find it on Twitter, to find it uh, from your friends on Facebook, there's still, I think, kind of an elemental desire among people to have some neutral place where they can go and see what other people are reading because that's the only way that you can have a broad broad conversation. So you know, hopefully we'll be one of those places where um, people can go and see like, oh, this is what the Huffington Post is saying and I care because I know other people are reading it so I want to I want, I want know. Here's actually the last question for Ryan. Uh, winning the Pulitzer, what does it mean for uh, Huffington Post and online journalism and online original online, or online websites. Are I mean, uh, just got a graduation from Huffington Post, and uh, um, what does it mean? Uh, that be the last word. Well, it's a, you know, it's a huge deal, right? 
unbelievably proud and, and thrilled at it. Uh, I think it'll um, help us a lot with the, with the mainstream crowd. Uh, you know, it's, it's bullshit, right? Yeah. Um, it's a big deal. Um, and I think it'll help us uh, a lot with uh, maybe some uh, older sources who aren't as familiar with new media. That, you know, oh, okay. These guys, these, these guys are ser doing serious real journalism. So um, I better, I better return the call. Um, in the political world, I think we've uh, you know, established that over the last couple of years, so we're okay there. But just out in, out in general, outside the Bellway and outside Wall Street, I think it'll, it'll help there. Great. Well, uh, thank you everyone for listening to this conversation. I hope you uh, got some out of it, and thank you, panelists, for, for being on it, and uh, thank you for knowledge for hosting this. Thank you so much.